In the first video, Whatever Happened to Gender, we traced the timeline of gender and identity in the last 50 plus years. In the next video, we looked at God's definition of transitioning and why transitioning is for everyone and why God wants to transform people. Now, I want to invite your attention as we discuss to trans and back. Imagine a lady by the name of Madison. Imagine on one Sunday morning, you're there in your congregation and it's your favorite time of the week. It's Sunday morning, it's the day of worship and a visitor walks into the congregation in a dress. And you notice as you're standing and looking over the auditorium that they're big boned. And you don't think twice about her being a female. You watch the movement across the auditorium and you notice others are looking at her, staring at times. As she gets closer, you notice a quite pronounced Adam's apple some facial stubble, but clean shaven. Madison has a deeper voice than most women and the arms seem a bit more hairy than most females. Madison gives you a firm handshake and a nice smile. You invite Madison out to lunch and in time, Madison is there attending regularly in your congregation. You're curious about Madison, but you would never, you would never have the heart to ask about transitioning. It seems so personal, but you're getting mixed signals from her. You see the Adam's apple, you see the dress, you see the muscles, you see the facial hair, but you never have the heart to ask. She's a soul created in the image of God and you want, you want what's best for Madison. You find out in time that Madison was baptized at age 16 and went to a Christian college and you have no knowledge of it, but Madison is six months into detransitioning back to her biological origin as female. Let's say, you or someone you know wanted to detransition. In medicine, there's a huge push for gender affirming care. But what about the desisters? What about the detransitioners? Don't they need care for too? People will say, well, you're assuming that gender is binary and you're assuming that gender is fixed. You are projecting your own beliefs on others. People will say, well, redirection doesn't work. It's shaming people. You're hurting people. If you were to encourage detransitioning, they will say things like conversion therapy or reparative therapy. It doesn't work. But there are detransitioners today. There are people who want to go back to their origin. You see, medicine and mental health, they're not morally neutral, nor are they objective when it comes to gender-affirming care. They're saying this, that gender-affirming care is the only way to go. But who will care for the detransitioners? Where's the care that's available for them? Listen to this quote by Catherine Butler and Anna Hutchinson. They wrote this in the February 2020 edition of the Journal for Child and Adolescent Mental Health. They said this, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, WPATH, they said that the standards of care will include a section on detransitioning, confirming that this is an increasingly witnessed phenomenon worldwide. It also highlights that compared to the extensive protocols for working with children, adolescents, and adult, adults who, who wish to transition, nothing exists for those working with desisters or detransitioners. Note that again. They said nothing exists for those working with desisters or detransitioners. How powerful a quote. They're saying that in mental health and in uh, medicine, that there's not a group of evidence for, or not a group of protocols and things like that to help individuals who are wanting to go back. New York Times and bestseller and Harvard physician Atul Gawan says this, I guess the lesson is you can't always count on the doctor to lead the way. Sometimes the patient has to do it. When we talk about going from trans and back, we're talking about patients that are leading the way. We're talking about individuals who are detransitioning, individuals who are wanting help, individuals who are wanting to go back to their, to their origin. So what is this transitioning? And what are some terms that flow out from time to time and some terms that you might wanna be familiar with? Biblically speaking, when we talk about gender, gender is binary, male or female. Gender, the term when we use the word gender, it's a psychosocial designation rooted in one's own perception or the perception of a group. Maybe you're familiar with the phrase sex assigned at birth, and that would seem to indicate the projection of male or female by a society upon the human subject. But when we think about it, the Bible would be in contrast to that. In the Bible, the Bible, gender is binary, and what a person may 
and feel in their mind or feel in their, their heart is identical to what they are biologically speaking. There's not a difference. Um, what the mind believes and the physical characteristics are one. In the Bible, gender is binary, male or female. Genesis 127, male and female, he created them. In Matthew 19 and verse 4, he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? There was no third sex. In the Bible, there's no distinction between gender as a psychological category and sex as a biological category. God made them male and female, and both of them are made in his likeness. And when he finished, he said it was very good, Genesis 131, and they were to be fruitful and multiply. But then there's this other term besides gender. There's this term that goes around sometimes known as sex. What is sex? Sex is a biological or scientific designation based upon genetics and anatomy. You're either XY male or XX female. Concerning the human mind, no act of the human mind makes a person male or female. An act of the human mind recognizes male or female, but it doesn't make a person male or female. Listen to this quote from Robert Smith. He said, so while all kinds of things can and do go wrong with each and every one of us, both physiologically and psychologically, the Bible offers no support to the idea that one can actually be a man trapped in a woman's body or a woman trapped in a man's body. That may well be a person's subjective feeling, but it's not an objective fact. Listen to Vaughn Roberts. Vaughn Roberts says this, our culture says your psychology is your sexual identity. Let your body be conformed to it. The Bible says your body is your sexual identity. Let your mind be conformed to it. And that's what Vaughn Roberts says. When we think about these de different definitions, when we think about to trans and back, there are different definitions that we should look at. Maybe you think about gender roles. And these are behaviors that are consistent with one's created design, with one's nature and with one's glory as God has designed it. You go back to the book of Deuteronomy, and here's some instruction to those Israelites. In Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5, it says, A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. The sexes were created with certain glory, and to infringe on that was to act in an unholy way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 15, we see that a woman's long hair is for her glory and for a covering. In Titus chapter 2 and verse 5, women are to be working at home. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 14, it says young widows are to manage their own household. You see, the Bible has something to say about certain gender roles. There are unnatural acts that are done between men and men and women and women, Romans chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. And there's effeminate acts that are done sometimes by men in passive homosexual roles, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. So when we think about these gender roles, it's important to understand that God has something to say about the fullness of what it means to be fully feminine or fully masculine. And there's another term that comes up from time to time, and that's this word cisgender. Cisgender is a phrase that refers to biological sex and psychological gender, those two aligning. And we would say that those are cisgender individuals. Then there's this word known as gender dysphoria. And gender dysphoria or gender incongruence is an incongruence between one sex that is their scientific designation, and their psychological gender. The DSM-5 would describe it this way, incongruence between one's experience slash express gender and their assigned gender of at least six months duration. That's how they would define gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria, though, is not the same as homosexuality or being transgender necessarily. And then there's this phrase heteronormative. Heteronormative is the view that sex aligns and that it aligns with gender and seeking the opposite sex is what's normal. So this is a term that floats around from time to time, heteronormative. And then there's the word transgender. Transgender. That's when people want to transition away from their biological ident identity and socially transition to the opposite sex. When you think about transitioning, there are four types and four things that go on when we talk about transitioning. In general, 
transfeminine describes male to female transi transitioning. In general, female to male describes uh, this term known as transmasculine. It describes female to male transitioning. So there's either male to female or female to male. When you start talking about the types of transitioning, there is what's known as social transitioning. This would be an individual that transitions roles or dress or pronouns. Uh, and so maybe it's a, a male who's now cooking more or something like that, or a female that maybe is mowing the lawn a little bit more or something like that. This is called social transitioning. Then there's what's called medical transitioning. Medical transitioning would mainly involve certain medications that are given, puberty blockers, uh, giving uh, certain drugs that are sex hormones like estrogen or testosterone. And these can happen at different periods depending on the age of a patient. Male to female transitioning involves giving estrogen and anti-androgen drugs. Female to male transitioning involves giving testosterone to masculinize, to cause hair growth and a deeper voice and a different Adam's apple. And it sometimes can cause acne and things like that. And then we think about surgical transitioning. And depending on whether a person is going male to female or female to male, there are head surgeries and there are top and bottom surgeries. If a person's going male to female, there might be forehead surgery or eyelid modification. Uh, there might be nose reshaping or lip, lip augmentation or maybe adding an a Adam's apple or something like that. There are top surgeries that happen uh, and bottom surgeries as well. There is also female to male surgeries that are also top surgeries and bottom surgeries as well. The fourth aspect of transitioning is what's known as legal transitioning. This is when an individual changes their name. They might change their gender marker, if you will. They might try to change their social security record, their driver's license, their passport, their birth certificate, financial records. This is legal transitioning. I want you to think about this as we think about to trans and back. There are certain conditions in medicine and in biology that we need to pause and think about. These are not elective. These are not uh, like Bruce to Caitlyn Jenner type things. They're individuals that are born with conditions that are known as disorders of sexual development. Previously, these were called infants that were born with ambiguous genitalia. The outdated term is hermaphrodite or pseudohermaphrodite or intersex. These conditions known as disorders of sexual development occur in somewhere between one in a thousand and one in 4,500 live births. Now follow me carefully here. If you're familiar with the acronym LGBTQI, the I in some instances, it stands for intersex. There are people that are born sometimes with both male and female tissue. And they're referred to as, these conditions are referred to as disorders of sexual development. There's a condition that's known as Turner syndrome. It uh, impacts between one in 2,000 and one in 3,000 live female births. Instead of 46 chromosomes with two sex chromosomes, the second chromosome, it's absent. So genetically, they're 45X with no Y chromosome on the outside. They may exhibit feminine characteristics. There's also something called androgen insensitivity syndrome and partial androgen insensitivity syndrome. And there's a mutation on the androgen receptor of the X chromosome. There's also what's called Klinefelter syndrome. And this could uh, this occurs in males who have an additional X chromosome. Now, why do I bring these up? It's important that we pause and think about people who are vulnerable in our society, parents, caregivers, and these children. They're sometimes involved in making very difficult decisions. These per people were born, these children were born a certain way, and they need care and compassion. They're not electing to be born this way. We need to pray for people who are born with disorders of sexual development. Their situations are different than those who elect to transition or detransition for that matter. In John chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, As he passed by, talking about Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And notice Jesus' answer. 
It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, in these disorders of sexual development, and people don't choose, they're not electing these things, but sometimes biology will, will uh, allow certain things to happen. And we need to extend compassion to them. We also need to extend compassion to people who are electing those transitioning and electing to come back because God would welcome them. Jesus died for them. And then there's a, another name that we should be familiar with, another term, and that's the word desisters. Desisters are people who have gone through some social transitioning. Maybe they've changed their pronouns or things like that, but prior to drugs and prior to surgery, they revert to their origin. These people may have changed, uh, you know, their clothes or their hairstyle or something like that, and now they desist. Now they no longer do that before the drugs and before the surgery. But I want to share with you. I want to share with you some cases about detransitioning. What detransitioning is, is it refers to stopping or reversing the transgender process. It could be, it could be social detransitioning, it could be medical, it could be surgical, or it could be legal. Detransitioning means going back. And I want to share with you a few cases that are out there, and you could look these up and, and learn a little bit more about them. One famous person that is a detransitioner is a man by the name of Mark Wenzel. There is a documentary out called Marky in Milwaukee. It's a 2019 documentary about Mark Wenzel. He's seven foot tall. He's a conservative Baptist preacher. And in 2006, at the age of 46, Mark came out as transgender. In the documentary, Mark Kliegman follows Marky and follows him for 10 years. And in following him, he details what transitions happen. The, the change of the specific pronouns, the struggle over the legality of his birth gender, and the longing to detransition and go back. It's a documentary that, that profiles that. There's another famous case that's out there. Her name is Kyla Gillespie. Kyla was born female in British Columbia, Canada. And at five years of age, she had gender dysphoria and same-sex attraction. She was a great athlete she became a professional woman's hockey player. In 2011, she transitioned female to male. She lived as a male for six years, then she detransitioned. And what Kyla Gillespie says is that faith played a major role in her detransitioning. What led her back? She talks about the emptiness. She talks about having one surgery and then another, and the notion that being male would somehow make her feel whole and complete, and that simply was not there. She felt empty, she felt broken, and she was crying out to God. She says that her faith played a major role in that. And then another person, thinking about detransitioning, Chloe Cole. In July, 19-year-old Chloe Cole spoke before Congress, before a House Judiciary Subcommittee. And she was calling upon Congress to halt gender reassignment therapies and surgeries for minors. She says her childhood, it was ruined by these interventions. Listen to her words. Listen to what she says. She says, I used to believe that I was born in the wrong body. She says, and the adults in my life whom I trusted affirm my belief, and this caused me lifelong irreversible harm. She says, I speak to you today as a victim of one of the biggest medical scandals in the history of the United States of America. She goes on, I speak to you in the hope that you will have the courage to bring the scandal to an end and ensure that other vulnerable teenagers, children, and young adults don't go through what I went through. She feels like the American healthcare system failed her. Chloe was only 12 when she had the, the medical team that diagnosed her with gender dysphoria, and she said she felt like a boy, and she looked up to her brothers, and all that that meant in retrospect was that she hated puberty. She came out by laying a letter on the kitchen table that she was coming out as transgender. Her parents were asked this question, would you rather have a dead daughter or a living son? Imagine being asked such a question. So she went on puberty blockers, and her first testosterone injection was at age 13. She had hot flashes from the drugs. At 15, Chloe had major surgery. She had a double mastectomy. Then she realized she had made a horrible mistake. Her body had now been masculinized. At 16, after the surgery, 
she was suicidal. Now, she's living with the consequences. Currently, she has skin grafts and her fluid still weeps from them. She says this, my doctors with their theories on gender thought that all my problems would go away as soon as, as soon as I was surgically transformed into something that vaguely resembled a boy. Their theories were wrong. The drugs and surgeries changed my body, but they did not and could not change the basic reality that I am and forever will be female. Powerful testimony. And then there's an individual by the name of Walt Heyer. Heyer tells of struggling with gender beginning at age four. He got married in his early 20s. He had two children. He was an executive for an automobile company. In April of 1983, he went through gender reassignment surgery. He tells of discovering the truth and having surgical reversal. He's written several books, one of which is called Trans Life Survivors. And it tells accounts of people who are detransitioning and walking these roads. So I want to ask you this question. What might I say if I were to run into Madison? We brought Madison up at the beginning. Madison was detransitioning. What might I say to her? I would say things like this. Madison, I'm not sure where you are at on all of these things biblically, but I would love to sit down and open the Bible and read some passages about gender and sex. And that certainly has application to detransitioning with you. Would you allow my wife and I to sit down with you? God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. God wants you, Madison, to have an abundant life. And listen, my wife and I, and maybe some of the ladies that I know, they would love to help you feel comfortable in a dress again and maybe heels and maybe a makeover. We have some ladies classes and you could come to those. I want you to know, Madison, that the church is your refuge. You are welcome here. And we wanna be there for you. We wanna help you in your walk with Christ. Madison, I can't imagine that you might feel some discomfort with the changes, the testosterone and the surgery and what all those things might have done to your body. I can't imagine all that you've gone through, but I want you to know that when you return to Christ and when you surrender to him, that you can be part of that body and that in Christ, all spiritual blessings are there. When you think about Jesus, he drew near to tax collectors, he drew near to sinners, and he'll draw near to you. Madison, you know in time, you might be able to reach someone else who's struggling, someone else who's going through a similar situation just like you, and you could be a source of inspiration to them. You could be a source of light, a source of comfort, a source of strength, because you walk down this road. You know, Madison, now is your time. Luke chapter 15 envisions the father embracing his wayward son, and now is the time to come home, and it was a time of celebration. It was an occasion of joy, and you're detransitioning. It's one of joy too. All things are new in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Bible says this, 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 11, And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Madison, I would really want this for you and I hope you want it too. And I wanna encourage you and I'm proud of you for walking through the doors of that building. I'm proud of you for, that you keep coming around here. I'm, it's an honor. It's an honor because it honors God. And I wanna help you fully embrace your origin your femininity, and I think that's what God wants for you too. In conclusion, whether you've transitioned or whether you have gender dysphoria or whether you're detransitioning, there's a war on your identity today. Satan wants to get to your soul through your flesh. It's a gender war. And God wants to guide us on that battlefield he wants us to see that there's love and compassion, that love is not fearful. It's not about being homophobic or transphobic, but sin causes people to be broken. Everybody needs the Lord. 
whether they've transitioned physically or not. They need spiritual transformation, something that only Jesus can give them. Jesus will set you on a high plane. He'll take you to the high place. He'll give you an abundant life. He'll let you love life and see good days. And I would hope that you would always give God a chance. God sent earth his best gift in the form of Jesus Christ, and he died for you. So wherever you're at today, commit your life to the Lord and live according to his word. Let God bring your sinful body to nothing and let God transform you according to his will. Christ can do it today.